My uh, computer is showing 6.30. We all set? Okay, let's get it rolling then. Okay, let's, uh, we're gonna convene the meeting, the uh, Board of Directors meeting for the uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Holly, would you please take the role? Director Henry. Here. Director Moran. Present. Director Falls. Here. President Swan. Here. Director Ferris. Present. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Rick, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? A uh, staff that does not have any additions or deletions. Okay. So we'll move on to the oral communications piece. This is for any of the, uh, any of the visitors joining to uh, make any comments that they have uh, on any item that's not on the agenda tonight. So let's see we, on the attendees, well, we've got about four attendees so far. Does anyone have any uh, comments they'd like to make? And it doesn't look like anyone has anything to say, so we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, unfinished business. Uh, Rick, you want to introduce our first topic? The uh, the past due process. The the finance manager will present this report. Stephanie. Hello, everyone. So the budget and finance committee has been monitoring the past due balances. Um, pretty much since it was suspended due to COVID-19. Uh, the last board meeting, um, we did bring uh, update to the, to the board as well. Um, at the last budget and finance committee meeting, it was recommended that we bring it to the board to consider starting up the late fees again. Um, some of the other agencies have been talking more, more about this. Rick may be able to give us an update um, based on his management call that he had, I believe, this week with more managers. But in general, the state still has a order in place to where, you know, water cannot be shut off. But there's nothing precluding the district from being able to still do late fees. Um, it gets to a point where bills accumulate to a point where people can't then dig themselves back out. So we think we have some that are able to, put, to pay but are choosing not to since there really isn't no penalties. And then there's obviously people that are, you know, impacted and are not able to pay. The district does offer payment plans. Um, going up to 12 months. So essentially, you know, what we really would like to do is to start to get some of these people contacting us, those that can pay, encourage them to pay, those that can't at least start the communication so that we can get a payment plan on the books for them and they can, you know, slowly start to chip away um, at some of that. So if the board did choose to move forward with this, we did kind of lay out what the process would be um, to where we would start to change the messaging everywhere that late fees will be starting soon. And then it shows, you know, for cycle two bills that go on the fifth, their eight five bill will have the message alerting them that late fees are starting back up. Those bills are due 826. The courtesy reminder would go out 827. Uh, with a due date of 9-4, and then if people don't pay those those bills by 9-5 mm -hmm. or don't contact us at all, they would get the $10 wait fee applied. And then similarly, similar cycle for um, cycle one, whose bills go out on the 20th. So we kind of can open it up for discussion. Rick may be able to chime in and let us know what some of the other agencies are discussing right now as well. Yes, thanks, Stephanie. I, we had our... Um, Bi-weekly uh, managers, what they call a brown brown bag virtual lunch today, uh, which all the managers except uh, Santa Cruz Water attended. 
all of the agencies are moving back to um, all forms of their collection process up to turnoffs. Uh, I do believe Watsonville is even going as far out as putting a door hanger, um, informing customers uh, that they are late and will have a penalty. Um, obviously, everybody is following uh, the governor's uh, um, requirement not to turn off or disconnect services. No one is proposing that, but they are all moving with late notices. Most of the agencies feel that folks in the past didn't pay their bills until they got those courtesy reminders and late notices. So they think it's imperative to move back and they're all moving in that direction. And they're really extending out trying to do payment arrangements and emphasizing that they'll work with the different, uh, different folks uh, on payment arrangements. So that's what the other agencies are doing. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Uh, okay, open it up for uh, board discussion, comments. Anybody have a comment, question on the board? No? Okay. Uh, so it sounds like a reasonable approach given the circumstances and what everybody else is beginning to do as well. And I can appreciate the fact that a lot of people don't pay attention to the bill until they get their late notice if they're typically slow pays. Uh, and we're still not going to be turning anybody off. The worst that'll happen is they'll get assessed a late fee and have the opportunity to work out a a payment plan so it, it sounds like a reasonable approach to me i had one question on the uh i saw where do, i forget where i saw it on the bill or the statement or something about uh if you sign up for auto pay you get a yeti cup whose idea was that steph uh that that was mine That's so it, we have a promotion we have it going right now it's if you sign up for the, the key that you have to sign up for electronic billing, meaning you have to turn off your paper bills to right. be able to get entered. If you are also signed up for auto pay, you'll get a secondary entry. And so at the end, I think it's open for the next like three weeks, um, we'll then go in and see everyone that qualifies for that. And then we have 25 Yeti cups that will we'll do a random number um, query to, to decide which accounts uh, win those as a way to try and get people to sign up for that. So essentially it, it more than pays for itself. Um, the district, you know, does pose to save a significant amount of money when we get people signing up for paperless billing. Yeah, no, I think premium incentives are a fabulous uh, way to go and are very effective. That's a great idea. Congratulations on that. That's wonderful. Uh, okay. So, the big thing back to the question. I'm sorry. Rick, Steve, I, I haven't had a real chance to, to discuss the, uh, the late fee uh, with the finance manager, but I, I think the board even should consider if people start paying their bills and get a late fee, if they're starting to back pay their bills, would be to waive that late fee. I have issues with late fees this time with COVID and unemployment that the whole idea is to get people to get back on track on paying their bills. Sure. So maybe something we want to think about, you know, once they start paying back, we can waive that $10 late fee. Yep. Uh, we do. We, I mean, we do have a uh, one-time late fee waiver that people can get when we started because the late fee is relatively newer in general. Um, and so any of these people that call and make their payment, you know, if they were assessed a late fee, um, you know, assuming they didn't already have one waived or, you know, we could choose to give everyone a, a, a grace on this one. Um, you know, we, we, it is typical for us to waive the late fee. A lot of times it gives them incentive to go ahead and pay the whole thing or to do something. So it, we do typically waive uh, one late fee. Sure. Okay. Uh, Steve, if I could make a comment, please. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, this is a question for Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, is the number of people uh, that are not paying their bills or late with their bills, uh, has that dramatically increased from normal? 
Uh, yeah. Yes, we're we're over. Yeah, we're about over double. So I mean, as of right now, if we were to turn around and assess a late fee, there would be 999 late fees as of today. The caveat with that is there's a lot of people that pay based off of getting the courtesy IVR notice. We typically see about over half the people pay. If I were to expand it to be the one prior billing cycle, we would have had 382 people um, getting it, where normally when we were doing you know, the tags regularly, um, we were at about 160. So we are over double the amount of people that are sitting on this. Um, you know, and there's really no way for us to know the breakdown of to, to how many fit into which category. You know, we have heard people state that, you know, cool, I, yeah, I see it, I know it. There's no penalties, so I'm just not gonna pay it until, you know, you guys are implementing a penalty. And there's obviously people that, that are having a, a hard time paying. And even now, you know, we still have some customers that are staying in communication, calling us and saying, hey, I know I'm behind, can I set up a payment plan? So we have some doing it now. We definitely get a very high volume of contact after we send out these courtesy notifications. You know, typically there's 80% plus of the people that are past due are signed up for these courtesy notices. So we really do get a, a pretty significant amount of people making contact with us based off of these. Okay, thank you. So I, I, su I support this um, recommendation um, it seems that we have to be, as Rick was expressing earlier, that, you know, maybe we could, uh, you know, waive the late fee uh, if people start paying again. It, it seems that, you know, minus the worst case scenario, you know, I, I think we're in uncharted territory here. You know, my parents lived through the Depression and where there was massive unemployment and uh, things were dramatically different. Um, hopefully we're not in that scenario, but um, I think, you know, we're trying to be considerate of people's uh, position and uh, we also have to pay our bills as well as a water district. So uh, we need their money as well. So um, I, I support this recommendation at this time. And I think if the situation got better or worse, uh, we can adjust to it. Sure. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Bob, you have a Comment, question? On the late fee. Speak up a bit, would, Bob. Would there be a late fee assessed on every bill that goes out then from this point forward? Uh, it, yeah, sorry. Uh, Stephanie, uh, uh, for, for people who are late on paying, um, would there be a late fee assessed on every bill that goes out to them from this point forward? So the one that goes out in August, there's a late fee. If they don't pay that, the one that goes out in September, there's a late fee. Um, is, that, is that correct? Correct. So they would continue to incur late fees if they are not paying the bill or, and if they are not contacting us to set up a payment plan. So if they contact us to set up a payment plan, the plan. Bob, you appear frozen. You're froze, Bob. Well, while Bob thaws out, Gina, you have your hand up. You have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, just thank you. Just a comment. Um, I recommend that if part of the board's direction is to provide um, an additional waiver beyond um, the one waiver of a late fee that is currently allowed under district policy, that that be an explicit part of the motion and the board's approval. For okay. now, I mean, given we had just started the late fee process, I'd say the vast majority of our customers have not ever had their one-time fee waive. You know, for, for now, I would personally recommend that we stick with the one-time 
Um, and at the next board, you know, future board meetings, we could discuss doing a, another wave of them. Um, it all kind of gets to the point of if we say that we're going to continue to wave them, then essentially there's no in incentive. And I think what Bob was trying to ask about was the payment plan. So, for example, we have bills that are about to go out on Monday, the 20th. If someone were to call us today, tomorrow, and say, I need, you know, I wasn't able to pay my prior month's bill, can I set up a payment plan to avoid the penalty? They would be able, they would be able to do that. Um, I think what's going to happen is we're going to go from people would just sit here and say, oh, I need just two more weeks. Um, I think we're going to have people that have higher balances and we'll even encourage, you know, them to let them know that, you know, you can spread this out up to 12 months. Um, so, you know, those people that maybe would have selected two weeks, they may go ahead and turn around and select, spread it out over two months to, to give themselves a safe buffer. Um, so to, to Gina, there. to Gina's point, then the 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 ability to waive the one-time late fee that's existing policy, right? Correct. The one the, a one-time waive is, right. is is allowed. So we wouldn't be needing to recreate anything for for that. It would be if the board wanted to, you know, continue to allow multiple late fees to be waived. Right. Okay. Bob, are you uh, are you uh, in better technical shape now? Well, I don't know. It might be a bad broadband night. So some nights are better than others. Um, yeah, so Stephanie, the question I had was, well, you answered uh, part of it, thank you. Um, the question I had was, if someone had accrued two late fees, would the waiver apply to both or is it just to uh, a single late fee? It would be just a single late fee. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that, that I was clear on that. I mean, ultimately, Ultimately, what I'd like to do is is get to a point where we're um, um, uh, a groove, but I. Bob, you're breaking up pretty bad. Particularly as we are. Uh, going back into, um, uh, in some places, obviously not Santa Cruz, but who knows what will happen, um, going back into sort of a, a more aggressive shutdown. So I, I would want to um, tread on this very, very lightly if we're going to do this. And I think we might want to re-examine it uh, in a month once it's a little bit clearer where the, um, the governor is going to be taking the state and ultimately what that means is taking employment or unemployment. Um, be, because if we're starting to see uh, severe distress with people because they're losing their jobs again, then we may need to revisit this. Yep. Totally agree. Anybody else on the board have a question or comment? That will go to the public. And uh, at the top of the list, we have Tina. Toe too. Hi, this is Tina. Please go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that um, I received an email from my daughter's school today saying that they're not going to be starting school in the fall because the COVID numbers have increased so much, um, even overnight, that they already predict that it's not going to happen. So that's to me an indication that this is going to continue and going to be difficult for a select number of people, especially those 15% um, that, are, that are on unemployment right now. And um, I'm just wondering if there's, I mean, we're doing the Lira program, which I think is great. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a way for others to, you know, to signify that maybe they're out of work and that, that having that extra late fee would be really difficult for them. Um, outside of the Lyra program, right? So that's, that's just my question. Um, I'm just, I am, I agree that we should start collecting money and that you should, um, you know, not let everyone get so far behind that they can't pay it. But at the same time, just be aware that that, that, that uh, is happening for the, as far as the pandemic goes. That's all. Okay, thank you, Tina. 
Uh, Jim Mosier, you have a uh, your hand up. You're on mute. There you go. I just wanted to echo what Tina said, and uh, I'm wondering if, as we send out notices about the um, about the late fees, that we could also uh, publicize the Lira program as a way for people to help uh, help people who are who qualify, so we can get that information out. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, let me go back here. Uh, Stephanie, do we have any, are, are we promoting the LURA program? Um, I saw something in email the other day, or was it on the website? Yes, it came out, it, yeah, it's on the website. It came out in our e-newsletter um, as well that, you know, it started on um, yesterday, on the 15th. Um, and so we'll do something as well in the bill, in the upcoming bill messages as well now that now that it's in there but mainly it's going to be um you know social media the e-newsletter does reach a lot of people um and then the message um on the bills okay good so we'll promote it bob your hands up yeah so if i can summarize what we're trying to do at this point is see if we can sweep in payments from people who can afford to pay but maybe uh, not paying because there's no penalty not to pay. Um, Gina, there wouldn't be anything um, that wouldn't allow us to uh, increase the number of waivers for people who really are in extremists, uh, would there, uh, going forward? If, let's say, we did the sweep to get people in, hopefully, a couple months from now, maybe if the shutdowns are more intense, we and, you know, and we have some people to get waived, um, some shutdowns get more intense, people fall behind again. Is that possible for us to do additional waivers? Well, it's, it's a little bit problematic under Proposition 26, where, um, which requires that any type of fee um, be justified in terms of, uh, uh, it be reasonably allocated among the payors and it be justified in terms of the burdens or benefits. Um, uh, per payor. So under 26, the late fee should be related to an, at least an estimate of the district's costs of um, administratively, you know, the administrative costs related to collecting from customers who become past due, um, which means that if you start having kind of unlimited waivers, you're potentially setting the Prop 26 uh, analysis. So um, I, I think that you know a one waiver, a couple waivers can pretty easily be justified without you know rocking the boat on 26 to too great a degree. But if it becomes an ongoing thing, we may need to revisit the fee entirely and how it's structured. Well, yeah, I mean I wasn't talking about unlimited. I, that that didn't come up at all in my comment. But I was talking about doing more than one. Um, so possibly to maybe maybe more, but then things might get a little bit dicey. Um, all right, well, I, I, would, uh, I would be in support of this, but I would like to make sure that um, if, if this is at all possible, Rick, that we have uh, kind of a regular, um, you know, monthly or bi-monthly report on this so that we can track this closely and make sure that we're not putting undue burdens on our community either, those particularly that are hard hit by the, by the COVID virus. I know that the impacts on people is not uniform. Some people are perfectly capable of working from home, but there are a lot of folks in hospitality, restaurant services, that sort of thing that are being impacted just severely. We can, we can keep uh, the finance committee updated and the full board updated. Um, that would be great. Because it is a you know a very serious issue, and we want to make sure we handle it you know, responsibly. Thank you, Rick. Great, Bob. Would you like to put that in the form of a motion? And we can move along. Um, um, I guess I'm a little uh, unsure of what the motion would be. One waiver is already in the policy, so. Are we, do we need a, 
Do we need a motion? No. Well, we need a motion to recommend that the board start up or that with the finance start up with the late fees again to provide that incentive they were talking about to customers. Yeah, to get the people that can pay to, to come in. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, um, do we have a motion language here? We don't. Um, well, I think you just said it, Bob. That's perfect. Yeah. It, yeah. All you need to do is to um, direct staff to re-implement late fees. Um, and if you want to add something to it, you could. I mean, the, the part of it where the staff will keep the board and budget committee updated, I don't think that needs a motion. That that's just should be normal course of business. But I move that the um, uh, board direct the district staff to um, re-implement the late fees, starting with the, was it the August bills, um, Stephanie? Uh, yes, bills going out from August on. Starting with the bills going out from August on. Great. Thank you, Bob. I'll second that. Holly, would you like to take a vote? Record the vote. <clears throat> Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. Thank you, Holly. Rick, what's our next item? Yes, uh, item 5B is uh, the district uh, board policy manual and the, uh, the district council Nichols will present this report to the board. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, as I'm sure everybody here recalls this board policy manual item is returning to the board. Um, it was initially it came to the board on June 4th based on um, my recommendation to deal with an issue that has come up in the context of these remote meetings that we're doing in light of COVID-19. And um, my concern that was um, uh, driving the uh, presentation on June 4th was that in the past, um, at district meetings, when materials have not been available at the time the board packet is published, um, those materials have been brought in hard copy and handed out to board members and to members of the public there um, to comply with Brown Act requirements and um, uh, good governance procedures. Uh, however, it's very difficult to do that with these remote meetings. The only way to really make materials easily accessible to um, board members and members of the public who may wish to review them is to, uh, you know, either include them in the board packet or post them to the website. And so that was the initial driver of the policy. There was quite a bit of board discussion on June 4th about um, uh, the policy recommendation and other potential issues and aspects that should be included in the policy and the board referred the matter to the administration committee for further discussion. Um, I participated in the administration committee meeting um, a couple of weeks ago where this issue was discussed at some length and I've attempted to summarize um, the recommendations from the administration committee um, which included that um, you know, in the usual course of business, meeting material should be available when the agenda is posted and should be included in the packet. Um, and there was also a concern that um, the policy would be helpful for all board meetings, um, at least regular board meetings, not just remote meetings. And there was a desire to broaden it to all um, regular board meetings. There was also some discussion of potentially broadening, broadening it to um, committee meetings, though that was not part of the, the recommendation from the administration committee. Um, part of what the administration committee recommended was that we're meeting, uh, they changed the uh, deadline that we had originally proposed of noon the day before the meeting, and they suggested that for meetings that couldn't be available in time for the regular board agenda packet, the deadline would be 5 p.m two days before the meeting. And the idea there is that staff needs enough time with all the competing um, matters they have to attend to, to be able to post those to the website before the meeting. 
Um, and in those rare instances where they can't be posted before the meeting, they would be made available on the website after the meeting. And that rule would apply to um, committee meetings as well. Uh, there was also discussion of public comment letters. And um, the recommendation there was that uh, public comment letters that miss the 5 p.m. deadline two days before regular board meeting would be included as written communications in a subsequent agenda packet. If they make it by the deadline, then staff would endeavor to post them to the website before the meeting. Um, what I've provided for you here in the board packet is a resolution number 120-21, which would adopt changes to the board policy manual that are based on the recommendations that came out of the um, uh, administration committee discussion. Um, copy of the board policy manual with the proposed revisions to policy is attached to the resolution. And if you want to see a red line of the policy so you can see exactly the language that's being recommended, you could go to pages 51 and 56 of the agenda packet. And you'll see the exact red lines that are being suggested uh, to sections uh, section nine of the board policy manual and at page 56, you can see the red line suggested to um, uh, section 10 of the board policy manual. And with that, I'm, um, I am I'd welcome especially comments from administration committee members as to whether this um, appropriately captured their recommendations and comments from um, the board as a whole. Thank you, Gina. Bob, you're one of those committee members, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I think we had a really robust conversation about this. We explored a number of different possibilities and really dug into the pros and cons of, of all that. And Gina did a great job on, on helping guide the, uh, guide the discussion. From my perspective, this does um, uh, meet the uh, recommendations that were made uh, by the committee. Um, I think there are some things that, you know, going forward, we, we probably need to consider as a, as a board, not directly related to this, but, you know, in terms of how we manage our agendas, given that these remote meetings, I think, as Gina indicated, uh, look like there's no end in sight um, on them. The, there are tools available that would make all of this much more compatible with remote meetings and which would even work for meetings in person when we get back together. But in the meantime, I think this is an appropriate um, uh, step to take to maximize transparency with our community, as well as give staff as much time as possible to be able to uh, deal with things that, that come in. And Lois, I, you're a member of that committee too, so if you have some comments, please do uh, weigh in. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. You're recognized. Thank you. Yes, Gina, you, you got what we talked about. Um, and it was the deadline was pushed back a little bit be, or forward or whatever way to five o'clock because if it was noon on the day before the meeting, that would only give a few hours for uh, the district secretary to uh, get it out there. And if there was any complications, uh, we just thought would be more time, should have all day to get anything that might come up uh, on the day before the meeting. Great. Thank you, Lois. Um, anybody else have a comment or question? I if not, we'll I'll, I'll, have I'll, another I'll, question. Or oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I was just going to say I support this in uh, the policy trying to get equal access of information to the public and the board. I support that. That's what I see is trying to happen here. Also to relieve any undue stress on the staff, trying to get things done in the last minute. We don't need to increase this, the stress of trying to get this agenda together. I think this uh, speaks to that, and I support it. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Bob, you had something else to add? Bob? 
Sorry. Sorry, just one really quick thing that's on page 56. We did also want to make sure that the committees were a little bit more flexible. So if you look at item number 10, which I think is 56, yeah, 56, it says for telephonic or other remote or virtual regular board meetings, meeting materials not posted to the district's website before the meeting should not be shown to board members during the meeting. We excluded committees on that specifically to give staff a lot more flexibility on being able to do that. Obviously, we'd want to um, uh, get as much out in advance as possible, but uh, we do have a little bit more of a, uh, you know, a lighter touch in committee meetings than we do in the, in the board meetings. We didn't want to hem that in. So. Okay, thank you, thank you Bob. Uh, any comments from the, uh, our public regarding this? Going once, going twice. Okay, back to the board. Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and make a motion. I'm sorry. I'd like to make a motion, Steve. Oh, please go right ahead, Lois. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we approve number one, 20 21, uh, to the board policy manual. And I, that's all I have to say, right? I don't have to read no, it. And I'll, I'll second, second that, that, Lois. Okay. Terrific. Okay, Holly, would you like to uh, record the vote? Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Lou. Gina, you have a comment? Did I miss you? Well, I just wanted to make one um, comment, which is that uh, we have an unusual circumstance related to an item um, at later at today's meeting where um, a spreadsheet that was included in the board packet wasn't fully reproduced. And uh, it is possible that the district manager may want to um, show that during the meeting um, for reference. And I would anticipate that this would be an exceptionally rare uh, sort of exception to the rule that that, that shouldn't be done. And that um, going forward, we would try to avoid a circumstance where a spreadsheet gets like misreproduced in that manner. Okay, thanks, Gina. Uh, okay, uh, Rick, moving along. Yes, uh, moving along to item 6A is the uh, item, the Chatterbox, which is the district's outreach consultant contract extension. And the um, environmental planner is with us tonight and will pre be presenting that report. Harley? Great. Yeah, thank you, Rick. So back in March, we did enter into a contract with Chatterbox PR. Um, to begin establishing an outreach and communications plan along with implementation of that plan. Um, since March, Chatterbox has assessed both the weaknesses and strengths of our former outreach. Um, they also determined recommendations and goals for us and put together a three-month outreach plan. Um, along with being much more active on social media sites and creating some new social media platforms such as Twitter and Instagram. So when we entered into this contract in March, we actually split up their proposal um, from phase one and phase two, um, separating out phase three. And that was about half of what the proposal was, and that was initially $20,000. Um, since then, uh, we've used up that amount and are ready to enter into phase three. And that would be um, approximately $23,000. Um, right now in our budget, we have $25,000 allocated for this fiscal year. Um, and that amount would cover about 265 hours of work and the phase three implementation, which would be actually uh, going out in three month increments of plans, um, working with staff to put together uh, outreach. Um, and we are recommending that we move forward and enter into the second phase of the contract with Chatterbox. And then Rick and I are here to answer any questions. 
if, if I could just add to, to what Carly said, since we bought Chatterbox on, we have been, we've improved our, our social media and our outreach. Um, we have done several interviews with papers and, and local organizations, business associations. I'm hearing from other water district managers that they've seen a, a large increase in our outreach program and have asked about how we are doing it and are, are interested in, in following in our footsteps. I'm hoping that the members of the board are seeing and, and hearing the same um, and uh, I have a positive uh, outlook towards Chatterbox. And I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. Thank you, Rick, for that uh, input. Any, uh, any board members with any questions or comments regarding this? I see a hand uh, from Lou. Lou, you uh, have the floor. Thank you, Steve. Carly, the last time this was brought up to the board, I had made a suggestion that we look at all the comments uh, specifically towards anything that was actionable that we would want to break out and uh, take some, um, some considered action towards in terms of improving uh, our outreach program. Has that been done? Yeah, so with these three month outreach plans that we've put together, um, these initial three months, uh, Marcy from Chatterbox actually believed that all the comments that she had gone through and reviewed would be answered through this outreach plan. Um, and what we're doing through our different social media platforms, the e-newsletters, we're addressing those questions, maybe not directly to the person um, that the survey was completed by, but more broadly to the general public. So how would I know what comments were considered actionable and what actions were taken? Right, I don't believe we actually shared the direct comments. Um, I'm not, maybe we did with just the board. I'm not sure with what happened with that. Maybe Rick has a better information. Did we share the actual comments from the survey? Just to be clear, I wasn't talking. To some of board members, some uh, not to all board members, but a couple who requested we did share comments. So if Lou, if you haven't received that, we'd be more than happy to share that with you. If, if I understand you right, Lou, you're, you're, you because Lou, Lou was one of the directors that received the comments. And I think Lou was asking, are we addressing some of those comments that were asked in this exactly. outreach? Which ones are we going to, are we going to address? And, and, and I believe we are. And that is our process moving forward um, with Chatterbox. I'm sorry, I still don't understand how we're addressing the actionable comments. And where can I go to find that information? So we can reach out to Marcy. I'm not sure which exact comments you're referring to. Maybe we can have a conversation offline if you want to address those. But it sounds like from my understanding with what Marcy found in within the comments, she felt that we were going to address them throughout our outreach. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're going to see Lou a specific question and answer. Right. But each of the outreaches and, you know, the different uh, uh, social media and outreach will be addressing those comments in a, in a kind of a subtle way and not a list of, of Q&A. Does that make sense to you? Well, I, uh, I, w I would still like to see not all comments addressed, but those that we consider actionable, those that... I mean, people took their time to give us not only survey responses, but also comments. And I think to the extent that some of those are really good comments that we want to do something about, I think we need to, to not only do something about it, but then respond to the community saying, hey, we're doing these things because of comments we got from the public. In other words, showing that, that we re really are reaching out and being transparent. Okay. Let's get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Bob, you have uh, the floor. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I guess the thing that I'm still struggling with here is, you know, what, what are the, what's the goal and objective that we're trying to get to? What is the metrics by which we are going to determine that we have successfully um, engaged with the community? Um, we're not a private for-profit organization. We're not even a nonprofit organization that depends on 
donations and attendance at events and that sort of thing. We're a, we're a public agency that is effectively a monopoly within the sphere of what we sell. Um, and I, I just, when, when I look through some of the postings, it, it's, it's almost like we're, um, we're trying to build a brand in the way that an Apple would or, um, or some other private company. And I really think what, at least from my perspective, what the objective is, is how we build trust and start engaging the community in some very uh, frank conversations about some of the items that are facing the district, the major challenges that are facing the district, and being able to put together um, a set of information that, that goes beyond you know, 280 characters or a cross post between Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, I, th I think the, the opportunity that we have here is to do something that's much deeper than at least what I've, what I've seen so far, which is, is, which is good as far as it goes, but I don't know that it's really getting to the heart of, of what our, our issues are. Um, I was having a little trouble in the reports also determining the exact number of posts that were done and what sort of metrics we were looking at in terms of engagement, in terms of people um, responding to those. So I did just a quick check. Um, I know that we've just started up Twitter, so I, I get that the number of people is going to be low. Um, but what is the objective for the number of people following us? With Facebook, I think we might have gone up 50. Um, you know, we also aren't saying in the posts that we do, you know, sort of uh, really call to action. You know, what is it that we want them to do? Do we want them to follow us? Uh, because, you know, a lot of the neighborhood groups on Facebook have thousands of people. And you would think that a uh, essential service like ours would have more than 1,500. I, I think we need to be looking at those kinds of things at a more fundamental level than, than what we currently are. Um, I also think that part of the, the things that Lou is talking about in terms of addressing the issues that the community has expressed through the, the comments really need to be taken for further discussion into the committee, uh, which includes board members, of course, because a lot of what the communication needs to happen here needs to have a lot of board uh, focus on it. And through the, for example, the administration committee, whose primary role is engagement with the community, right now we're not involved in that in, at all. And we actually have resources on that committee that have some background in this as well. So I, I, I'm just very troubled by how we're approaching this. Uh, and I think the last comment before I, I turn the floor back to Steve is we, we have an election season coming up and I'm also very sensitive to the nature of the information that gets published over the next four months. Um, you know, during the 2018 election, there was sort of a promo piece that was put out that was for the context inappropriate for, uh, for that time period. And uh, I guess I want to be really careful about what is uh, being put out here over the next few months. This actually might be a good opportunity for us because of that to sort of take the information that we've received over this current three or four month period and put it back into a review process where we can actually see what the goal should be, what our objectives are, what's the ROI that we're looking for, and is this money going to be well spent um, given all of the other things that we have to spend money on for which we are still uh, not well funded on those items either. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Carly, or, or do you want to address any of Bob's uh, comments or concerns or Rick? Yeah, I think um, there is a lot in that, but I think um, starting out with right now in this phase, I do believe we, we are building that audience on all these different platforms to then be able to have the audience to, to give this more um, engaging content to. And just looking right now, we do use a platform known as Sprout Social. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Bob. But what it does is actually analyzes each social media platform and the engagement we're receiving. And just quickly looking at it from logging in, in the last 28 days, we've 
gone up a 200 likes on Facebook, which I think is pretty significant, at least from what we had in the past. And there's a lot of data in this Sprout Social that we can bring to the board if that's something that we want to get into that, or maybe we bring it to one of our committees to discuss. I think we bring it, yeah, I think we could bring that to the admin committee for sure. Okay. I mean, those are the kinds of numbers that we really need mm -hmm. to be. All right, go, go ahead, uh, Carly, if you were, unless you were finished. Yeah, I mean, it looks, did Lois, did you have a comment or? Uh, yeah, I, I've i got an issue though. All of a sudden I'm huge here. And I also don't know how to raise my hand. How do I get myself so, back to normal here? Just, just scream, any... Lois. Just scream, we'll, we'll catch you. <laughs> just scream? <laughs> yeah. We yeah, but, but I, all I can see is myself. Well, that's the view that you, yeah. that you must have hit the view. You want to go, you want to uh, redo uh, your view and. Uh, Where's the view? Uh, to move, the move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen and a bar should pop up that shows participants, chat, screen share, record. You see all that? Yeah. Okay. Where it says participants, click on that. Okay. Now to the right side of the screen, do you see a list of names? Oh, and it says raise hand too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, but how do I get myself back to normal here? You, that, that's as normal as you need to be, Lois. Keep the, keep the pane on the right, listing the names. And there's plenty of you on the screen for me. I, I don't want to. I don't want to be the big thing on the screen. Well, you're not. Go, go to the upper right-hand corner <laughs> and click on the, the tic-tac-toe board. You see the tic-tac-toe board up top there? Like a tic-tac-toe like board. <laughs> you know, all the little boxes, like a, a, a cube. Unpin video. Uh, click on that and it'll get that. You, you, you've changed your view. Just click on that and oh, you'll- Oh, wow, now, all I, you're, now you're huge, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever, and the other Rick. I, yeah, okay. whoever, <laughs> oh, never mind. They're in speaker view good. now. Lois, did you have a comment on the item we're talking about here? <laughs> or did you just want a, a tech lesson? No, I, I don't want to heckle you. I, I, I just had a couple of issues. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not a good one on this um, social media because I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I, I don't do next door. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of people in Lompico that computers don't work too well, even they have to go to the library or somewhere. Uh, of course, that's not happening now. Um, so I, I don't know how, if, if we're gonna put all our emphasis on social media, might be missing some people. Uh, I, I mean, it, I'm not going to miss anything because I'm on the board, but. Right. Well, we have the website and then we do have the newspaper yeah, for wanna, press releases and stuff. I hear things from people who say, members of the public who say to me, I hate this website. It's harder to use than the one before. And I actually have the same issue with the new website. Okay. Well, that's a topic for a, a, a different meeting, Lois. I, I, I know that. And I'm not trying to be negative here. I'm just saying that there, you know, there are a lot of things we can do um, besides social media to get to people, I think. But maybe I think wrong. Maybe I'm just too old fashioned or something. Well, let's ask Carly. Carly, with respect to Chatterbox, are they exclusively uh, only looking at social media vehicles? No, not at all. So we have been active with the press banner, along with some other local media sources. Um, and I think they've we've actually had the last few press releases that we put out um, published for free in the press banner. Um, and I know that Marcy, every time we do do a press release, sends it out to all her contacts and whoever picks it up, that's what we have it put in unless we want to pay to have that as an ad. Okay, great. 
Uh, okay. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments from any board members at this time? If Steve, if I could go, Rick Moran. Yes. Uh, wait a minute, Rick. Lou's got his paw up, and he beat you to it. So go ahead, Lou. No, that Rick. You go ahead. You I okay? Start speaking before I put my hand up. Thank you. Well, I I, I agree with Lois. I think there's more than uh, just social media. I'm a fan of old style paper inserts into the billing, um, you know, that form of communication. So that being said, um, I, so I think we need to broaden our aspect so that it's not just totally focused on social media. Um, the other question I had, and I don't know if this is going backwards a little bit, but um, I was, you know, in the survey, I didn't know whether one thing that I would have liked to have found out is how many people read the agendas and how many people attend or um, re review the um, recorded version of our meetings. So what's the, the feedback on that? I, I didn't get that. Maybe somebody has that information. That's information that I would like to see. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as a specific thing that I want to make sure gets uh, addressed here shortly is uh, the reach outreach to uh, the neighborhoods that are having uh, pipe replacement and the tank replacement that they are specifically targeted uh, to let them know what's going on about road closures, about any, anything that, you know, uh, Rick has uh, that people would be concerned about. So I, I wanna make sure that gets out as soon as possible. And I know uh, earlier in the day at the environmental committee meeting, uh, we were concerned about fire uh, management information getting out there as soon as it can. So those are, uh, I, otherwise I, you know, support this. We, we've got the money in the budget. You know, I'm not going to stop that from uh, proceeding here, but I just had a few little things that I just wanted to include in the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Carly, are those types of uh, notifications included in the, the scope for Chatterbox or is that uh, some other group within the uh, water district that handles those types of notifications. Chatterbox will be doing some of that outreach. Um, as soon as it's received from operations, it'll probably go through me and then I'll bring it to Chatterbox to get out to everyone. Okay. Um, and then Rick, just to let you know, as far as the numbers for agendas and recordings, that should be something we can pull off our website. Um, I'm not aware exactly what those numbers are, um, but I could probably get that information from the website. Great. But yeah, Chatterbox would be handling any of the outreach that um, is regarding projects as well. Thank you. If I could, if I could add to uh, answer Rick Moran's question about projects, that'll come out of uh, out of the out of the district's admin. We just issued the notices of proceeds, and once we get project schedules, for instance, uh, we have the two mainline projects. I'm not sure where they're going to start. The contractor will tell us. Are they going to start at North Boulder Creek or are they going to start at California Drive? And once we have that information, then we target the neighborhoods. I didn't want to put, we don't want to put information out too early or information we don't know when they're going to start because it will be specific about telling them about possible road closures and, mm -hmm. and, and different things. So we're very close, but we don't have the, uh, the actual schedule from the contractor. Glad to hear that, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and just to, to comment on the inserts that you were talking about, Rick, that's, uh, I don't know how, how many inserts we do now, but they cost money. I think the last time, it's fairly expensive. So if we can promote more of this, uh, uh, you know, social media means, which is far more, uh, uh, you know, cost beneficial to us, we should really explore that more. I think some of the, uh, the issues Bob was relating to also with that, coming up on election season and the previous activities where inserts were used, I think inappropriately, or a mailing was done inappropriately, really that uh, caused us some, some concern. Um, so we don't want to repeat anything like that. Uh, Lois, your hand is up. Yeah. Congratulations on finding the button. Yay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Rick Moran, I appreciate all your remarks and Bob's and Steve's and 
I, I think we're moving ahead here and uh, yeah, there was an issue in 2018 with what went out. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen this time. And I, I know that, I hate to say this, Carly, but people in Lompico don't get the press banner. It's hmm. not delivered, period. So we don't always get the press banner. I guess we're a little backwards here in Long Pico. Um, Careful, Lois, that, you're stereotyping Long Pico. <laughs> I don't do that. Well, I'll get a phone call from Gina. <laughs> anyway, anyway, thank you, uh, Bob and Rick Moran and Steve for your comments. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Lois. Uh, Bob, you have your hand up. Just a couple of uh, things. Um, after that mailer was done in 2018, I went into the Boulder Creek Post Office um, after it had been delivered and the, the number of mailers that were in the garbage and on the floor was staggering. Um, I, I, you know, I think inserts are one thing, but standalone mailers, I think, are just at least not that kind of mailer, maybe a postcard or something, but certainly not that kind. It was, it was money that was wasted. Um, please keep in mind, Carly, that um, the post is now open for business um, and also Mountain Bulletin. Um, I think the press banner is moving towards where they want you to pay for the paper if you're not in a, in a dense delivery area. It's just too expensive for them to deal with, I think, anymore. So um, that, that is something that, that needs to be factored into whatever we end up paying for ads is what the reach is that we get. You know, before when it, when it went everywhere in the valley or almost everywhere and, and, um, and Scotts Valley, that's one thing. But if they're, you know, if the circulation has shrunk, the value of the ads are, uh, are much, much lower. Um, I'm also not really a huge fan of, of ads and given the budget that we have 25,000, that could get eaten up pretty quickly with ads. So they need to be really targeted on what you're going to do. But in general, I, I still think that we're, uh, this still feels to me a little bit like, um, you know, ready, fire, aim. We, we just don't have a great, um, and their plan doesn't really give me a sense of what the goal is, where we expect to get to, what the endpoint is, what the metrics are, what the measurements are, how we judge the ROI, and what the board involvement is going to be in, in helping craft these messages. It's, it's all very uh, vague. Thank you, Bob. Lou, you have a uh, comment? Or Car Carly, would, did you want to rebuttal anything? No, I agree with um, a lot of what Bob said. I will, I will comment that we did um, take advantage of the Post offered a free um, article, and we did take advantage of that. Right. Thank you, Carly. Lou? Thanks, Steve. Um, two comments more on Chatterbox. First of all, I'd like to commend both Carly and Rick for choosing Chatterbox as our social media outreach. Um, you don't need to go any farther than page four of the attachments to the board packet. Under the giving hour, they quote the Greek poet Homer who said, the charity that is a trifle to us can be precious to others. I think that speaks volumes towards the same values that we have uh, in terms of reaching out to our ratepayers, specifically with the Lyra program. So I, I really like the fact that we're using Chatterbox as our outreach. The second comment is, um, as you look at uh, page 14, where they're actually talking about additional marketing items, uh, they're proposing, and I'm not sure if this is something we're planning on doing, but they're proposing a press release on um, construction and capital improvement to go out this month in July. And this pains me to say, because infrastructure is my number one priority. But right now, I think the most important press release to go out in July would have to be Fire Prevention Month, which right now is scheduled for August. So I would just propose flipping those two, doing a press release on fire prevention this month, and then doing the press release you were planning on doing in July on capital improvement next month. 
Thank you, Lou. I think we can leave that to the staff to figure we'll out what we that want to do. After today's meeting, that change has been made, Lou. Great, thank you. After the fire management meeting today. Terrific. Uh, okay, let's go to the our public attendees and do you all have any um, comments or questions regarding Chatterbox and our outreach efforts and anything like that? Not seeing much of anything. <coughs> Coming back to the uh, to the board. So we have uh, what's our our ask here is to approve the uh, funding of phase three. Is that the gist of it here? Did I lose my place? Uh, hang on. Yeah. So. It's the recommendation here uh, that the board directed review and authorize the district manager to extend the contract with Chatterbox to continue to carry out the district's communication and outreach needs in the amount of $23,600. I'll make that motion. Second. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Oh, I'm sorry. Bob, do you have a question? Yeah, just a clarifying question. Is um, is the work that they're proposing to do for the rest of the year or is it only for part of the year? By rest of the year, I mean rest of the budget year. That I believe is, it falls, oh, sorry. Um, I believe expect, it falls a little short of the fiscal year. It's okay, exactly. So, so, it, so there may potentially be another ask for money later. Right, and we can work with Chatterbox to try to spread out those hours. Really what we're funding is the amount of hours that they're allocating, which is the 265 hours of work. Well, it looks look like phase three goes from July to January. Right, um, but because it is the hours allocated, I believe we can stretch those out depending on how we take advantage of their sure. use. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to you, Holly. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. Director Fultz? No. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. Rick, what are you teeing up next? Okay, item. Uh, uh, 6B is a district surplus property. Uh, this is gonna be a, a lengthy presentation. It'll be a two part presentation. I'll, I will give uh, an introduction into the, into the parcels um, and, and somewhat of an explanation to the parcels and district council will move into the process of surplus sale that needs to be followed, which is a kind of cumbersome and complicated, but an important process. Uh, earlier in the meeting tonight, District Council um, spoke about a spreadsheet uh, that is in this uh, item. It's the Excel spreadsheet that lists all the parcels that are being recommended to be disposed of, um, either through our software, or the two different types of software, and transferring over to the District Secretary. Two important columns were cut off. Uh, part of my recommendation and um, the zoning and we'll be putting that up on screen and we will be putting this to uh, on the on the website uh, tomorrow um, keep in mind we are not asking the board tonight to adopt any resolutions or to uh, to make a motion so to speak we are asking for direction uh, to staff and council to come back in a meeting with the final resolution and uh, all documentation needing to move forward. Uh, this is kind of an introduction to the full board tonight. Um, and if uh, CTV will put up uh, that spreadsheet, that would be great. And uh, we'll start uh, on the, uh, the rec we'll start with the recommendation. Uh, we're recommended that the board review this memo and perform the following. Review the attached list of district owned parcels that have been previous surplus by past boards but remaining in ownership of the district. Past boards have done this process, but staff has fallen short to dispose of these parcels. A lot of these were, were problematic that we are going to address uh, this time around. 
We're gonna review the attached list of district parcels, parcels recommended to be surplus and ask for direction designating parcels as surplus, exempt surplus, and exempt surplus earmark for disposal other than by auction. Three definitions that district council will speak to further uh, in this memo. We're gonna review legal counsel's draft policy to govern the disposal process for board approval. It's attached uh, in this memo. We're gonna, uh, I'm asking you to direct the district manager to facilitate a service contract with bid for assets, which is an online real estate auction site, uh, asking for board approval. We wanna direct legal counsel to prepare a resolution de-designating the administration building a surplus. Some years back, this was brought to the board to surplus the administration building to move ahead to uh, dispose of and move to a temporary facility. That went all the way up to board, but we cannot find if it was done by resolution. Where staff is still researching that, but we have a concern about this property being surplus because if it is surplus, if something was to happen to it in a natural disaster, such as earthquake or something being already surplus, it is doubtful that um, FEMA would cover uh, replacement costs or we may even have some insurance issues as it was designated no longer of use to the district. We're gonna ask, uh, we're asking you to also direct legal counsel to prepare a resolution based on the board's findings and direction tonight and policy in regard to these recommendations and return to the board for adoption to move forward with the surplus of district property by auction. With that, I'll give you a background. The district owns approximately 172 parcels throughout district boundaries. An update review uh, finds that 23 of these parcels have already previously been, de been declared surplus and are still in ownership of the district. And there are 15 additional parcels being recommended for surplus. Most of these parcels were obtained in the consolidation of Lompico and are no longer necessary to the district. These are like the Lompico main office building. You know, the district is not maintaining an office. Uh, old well sites, treatment sites, um, and they have some just parcels that are, are no longer needed. We're asking the board to uh, consider to surplus. Um, in addition, uh, there are seven parcels that require further discussion regarding maintaining ownership. These parcels are commonly known as the Zioni watershed. Uh, and at one in, uh, and at one time, this property was earmarked for the Zioni Dam that is no longer a capital project of the district, nor does the district have water rights to Zioni Creek. This One of these parcels are the same parcels that uh, the district just approved the, the Woody Debris Project on Zioni Creek. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, individual parcel information and mapping can be reviewed by going to the Santa Cruz County GIS website. Um, and that is a link in this memo. You, um, and none of you have, have gone to that website. It's a pretty unique website on the county GIS. You type in the parcel number, you'll get a parcel map, you'll get zoning information, you'll get a considerable amount of information. You'll get the size of the parcel, um, very interactive and, and you can uh, really look into it. Some of the recommend surplus properties may be problematic uh, to surplus due to facilities on the parcel that re may require abandonment. Some of these parcels are landlocked and these parcels will be, will be recommended to be designated as exempt surplus earmarked for disposal other than by auction, most likely a negotiated purchase with the property owner that, uh, that the property is, is an in-holding on. And these parcels have no legal access uh, across joining parcels. So these parcels have really no, um, no real value to anybody but the property owner in which this parcel is in, in, in holding on. One of these parcels is recommended to be exchanged for another property necessary to relocate a water storage tank in the Lost uh, Acres area. We have a very small 30 by 30 parcel with a small tank on it and we have the adjoining property owner that's going to give us a considerable easement for a water tank and water supply line. And as part of that uh, negotiation, we want to trade uh, for the easement. Uh, staff is trying to, declare, uh, trying to determine if uh, the board did declare the admin building a surplus. We have found information all the way up to, but we, staff cannot uh, 
uh, find a adopted resolution. So we're asking the board to, uh, to anyhow to consider redesignating the admin building from surplus. Requirements for declaring property surplus and disposing of property are very complicated. There are specific procedures for special districts to catalog their property, including surplus property, and to sell off this property. Surplus land means land owned in fee, simple by a local agency for which the local, agent or the local agency's governing body takes formal action in a regular public meeting declaring the land is surplus and is not necessary for the agency's use. Land shall be declared either surplus land or exempt surplus land as supported by written findings by a local uh, agency may take action to dispose of it consistent with the agency's policies or procedures. And later in this process, district council will explain those procedures and the policy. A local agency on an annual basis may declare multiple parcels of surplus land or exempt surplus land. Staff has investigated the best way to dispose of surplus land, either by a realtor, sealed bid, or property auction. In the past, the district, we have disposed of surplus property by sealed bid and handled the complete transfer of ownership. At times, the cost of the advertising and transfer of ownership was greater than the high bid received. Of <laughs> um, cities and counties have moved to online auctions for selling tax delinquent property. The County of Santa Cruz for some time has been using uh, a firm called Bid for Assets, an online real estate auction site for selling tax delinquent properties. The cost of this service is 10% of the auction price paid by the buyer. So if a, uh, that means that the auction price would, 100% of the auction price would go to the district and 10% and above that would go to the auction house for the cost. Um, and the cost is all paid for by the buyer. Bid for Assets completes advertising with a 200,000 uh, online bidders list. However, the district will do additional advertising, making sure that there is notice posted in neighborhoods and also making sure adjoining property owners are noticed of, of pending auction. Uh, they complete all ownership transfers and collections of funds. Um, there are non-refunded deposits that the buyer is responsible for that would go to the district if the uh, buyer would uh, not come through with the purchase. Moving forward, the legal counsel has developed a draft policy to govern the disposal process for board approval. Attached is the list of the district parcels, parcels rep recommending to be surplus, and that was also up on the screen right now. Uh, and uh, there's a, a, a the far right hand side, I have put determinations of which parcels are just designated as surplus and exempt sur surplus or exempt status earmark for disposal other than by auction. And council will explain. At the, July, at the July administration committee meeting, the committee discussed this item and recommended it moving forward to the full board before disposal of surplus planned by auction. And with that, I'll ask uh, district council Nichols to pick up on, on, this, the, on the surplusing process and add to this report. I'm happy to do that. Um, if you don't mind, um, Rick, I wonder if um, it makes sense to have some discussion at this point or if it should all wait until after I do my presentation um, because there is a lot here. Um, and of course, it's all interrelated. So you know, we turn it back over to the board chair for questions then at this point. Sure. Uh, I, I think it might be good. That sounds uh, super to me. Okay, so let's let's ask at this point. We'll take a pause and we'll ask uh, if any of the directors have questions or comments. I know I do. I see that. So does Lou and Bob and everybody else. So let's start with number one on the list. Lou, you're first up. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, Rick, a question for you. Uh, is not the admin building a red tag structure? Not anymore. We have, uh, we hired a, a local firm to, to bring in compliance and work with the county, and we have had all red tags removed from that building. So we have no issues relative to the occupancy of that building and any detrimental effects that that building might have on the, on the occupant. That's correct. At this point in time, that building is fully permitted. Okay, thank you. Bob, you're next in the queue.
Director which is Holt. interesting in itself. Yes. All right. Can you hear me now? I might be yes. going into broad, bad broadband, but um, uh, we can hear you now. So I was at the meeting where the. Uh, it, it, okay, sorry. It's the broadband kind of goes in and out this time of the night for some reason. Um, I was at the meeting where the the um, admin building was surplus. I was frankly a little astounded by it, but. Um, I don't recall if there was a resolution with it or not, Rick. We can't um, find one. But, but there was an affirmative vote on it. Yeah, I, it may not have been. It was sort of, I think it was pre-Gina and, you know, that didn't always work out so well. Um, Gina, uh, uh, or on the, um, during the discussion, this is, I think, a really key point. Um, there was this... Uh, category called exempt. Now, what had been explained to me before, at least back several years, is that the only way you could um, get rid of property was through uh, an auction process. That, that is, you couldn't engage an owner directly uh, to be able, a near, an adjacent owner directly to, um, uh, to dispose of the property. Is, is that something relatively new, or did we just have bad legal advice a few years ago? Well, um, well, let me put it this way. The, um, there is a new law under the, um, uh, the Surplus Property Act that now applies to districts that became applicable to districts in about 2016, if my memory serves. And that has completely overhauled the scheme that applies to special districts in disposing of um, surplus property. Um, now, the scheme existed to some extent before that time, but it applied more typically to municipalities, counties, rather than special districts. Um, and it's that law that creates this exempt surplus category um, that we're talking about now. So, you know, whatever advice was given before that act became applicable to special districts um, simply needs to be revisited now under the new law. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to bet that the last bid was sometime in 20, because it, it was kind of a, it was kind of a hot mess, the last one the district did, where there was two neighbors competing for the same uh, parcel. I think that was in 2016 or maybe early 2017, so the, the, the former attorney may not have been fully up to speed on it. Um, I, you know, from my point of view, just being able to see Rick and his team move forward in this and have some great has available to us is fabulous because you know some of these properties were were surplused as long ago as 2009 I think and you know it's one thing to do something it's another thing to execute and I'm really happy to see that Rick and his team are committed to executing on this and getting these things out from underneath us as quickly as possible. Thank you Bob. Any other uh questions or comments from any of the directors so I, I just had a question so there's in total we've got 172 parcels that we want to get rid of correct Rick no that's not correct we have 172 total parcels in ownership of the district in our boundaries uh, so total parcels are 23 plus 15 plus 7 is what we're looking to, to get rid of. And some of those have already been declared surplus, but I want authorization to move ahead with auction. So 23, uh, 15, 45. yeah, 45. It's what we're looking to, to dispose of. Okay. So, um, and it's, uh, it looks like there's a good vehicle for getting rid of them through auction vis-a-vis -vis this bid for assets outfit? That's correct. It's pretty much, you know, uh, turnkey. They do it all. They do, uh, you know, the deed transfer of ownership. They do the collection of money. Uh, they do it all. And uh, the County of Santa Cruz can't, you know, they think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. They've been using bid for auction. There are uh, most of the cities and counties who do tax sales now use bid for auction. They're well established in California. And we've done not a lot, but we've done a handful of property transfers in Santa Cruz County. And it's a nightmare. No two are the same. So if anybody can take the time and go down and district staff do not have to do that at the county building and spend, you know, Holly and I have spent hours and repeated trips 
uh, to try to move through um, ch changing ownership and getting things recorded at the county. It's, it's a nightmare. Okay. So, and there's some, some new properties that you want to have declared um, uh, obsolete or, or surplus or whatever. Right. That's correct. Most of them being uh, it came with the consolidation of Lumpico, like their main office building, right. uh, the treatment facilities that have become very problematic now with uh, homeless uh, dumping of vehicles and garbage, um, trespass. Um, so we we determined we visited all these sites. We physically have been to all these sites and determined that they have no use to the district or future use to the district. We're not going to put the intake back in at Lumpico. Um, we're not going to reopen the office at Lumpico. Right. Uh, so um, they do not have a use. There's a couple other parcels that uh, are in our, uh, our north system service area. The one I want to trade for the new Lost Acres tank. Um, that's came up. Um, and uh, some of these are going to be problematic. If you look at one of these, it's uh, the uh, it's the opposite side of the Ben Lomond swimming hole. The whole length of the Ben Lomond swimming hole, we own the opposite side of the river. We used to have an intake back there at one time, many, many years ago. You, you mean the swimming hole that isn't allowed to swim in? That's correct. Okay. And some of these parcels we own are, are unique. There is no doubt about it. And, and at one time or another, there was going to be an intake or a dam on every one of these little tributaries. And so we have a, a piece of property um, and it'll be good to get rid of. You know, that's a hell of a liability, or excuse me, that's a heck of a liability, the Ben Lomond swimming hole, because it still gets a lot of, a lot of people walk it and, and go down in that area. So if someone was to get hurt, you know, I, I'd let council speak to that, but no doubt we would be named in some type of a lawsuit. My daughter still has the scar on her leg from swimming in that swimming hole. Nice. Statue of limitation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then the last uh, that I, I did not make a recommendation to the board is what we used to what we call is the Zioni watershed. It's probably the bulk of this property, over 100 acres. Um, it uh, was planned to have a, a dam at one time, the Zioni Dam. It's located quite a ways out of our service area, up off of Zioni Creek. Um, we have no real use for that property. We're not planning on putting a dam. We're not, we don't have a water rights. We have no facilities. Um, we do have to maintain it. We do get trespass. We do get homeless issues. Um, and uh, we've had, you know, on and off uh, several issues with uh, illegal activity. Um, and we, you know, we have, it's a liability. So. I, I purposely didn't recommend a declared surplus because I think we need to have good discussion about that property at board level, just because I, this has come up by previous boards and there has always been discussion on this property at board level resulting in the district retaining ownership. So I thought it'd be appropriate to, to bring it uh, to the board and work with you on making a decision on that property. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Rick. I see that um, Lois found the raise hand button again. So we're going to let Lois start. ask a question and make a comment. Okay. I, I kind of want to go back to the auction. I think that's a fabulous idea because it takes some of the work away from staff where they have to um, work with deeds and property and at the admin committee I brought up how as a law as a as a, a credit union person sometimes we had to repo a car and every now and then I would go out with another employee and we would actually repo believe me you don't want to do that <laughs> people get mad and sometimes Lois, the repo man mad. And it's scary. Um, so I, I, nobody's going to hopefully put a gun to uh, Rick's head if he wants to get rid of any property. But uh, it, it needs to have somebody who knows how to deal with property, which the auction house would take care of everything. It'd be out of the district's hands. 
as for if I can go to the Ziani property, the watershed, my understanding is that we don't have water rights for that property. The property therefore is really not beneficial to the district. Um, and the county, or I guess the city, it's the city of Santa Cruz. It owns adjacent, adjacent property. It's the city, Rick? That's Is, correct. City of Santa oh, Cruz. Okay. So I don't, oh, there's, there might not be any hope that they would be willing to take that property over. Um, but it, it is a cost to the district to maintain that property. And it, it's, I'm sure it's absolutely a lovely property. I don't know, I haven't really seen it, but it probably is, but we don't need to keep it because it's a really nice property. If it was beneficial to the district, I could see keeping it. It is a watershed, and if if the city of Santa Cruz won't take it, we may just have to keep it, or I don't know what we can do with it. If we can sell it uh, to individuals, I, I don't know what that does. I, it, is the woody debris uh, issue right there by where that property is, Rick? It is on one of the parcels. There's a total of, of seven parcels in that general area uh, that we own. And one of the parcels has the woody debris. It is considered um, good quality watershed. It is a co the Zioni Creek is a coho stream. The fisheries agencies monitor that stretch of the creek because it is so pristine. It has the the habitat that steelhead rearing like, it has you know overhanging banks, woody debris, as you know. I would like to see if the district would like, if, if, the, if the direction of the board was to move to dispose, that we try to court other agencies that are in the business of protection of watershed, more so than the district, such as fish and wildlife, separate environments, there is redwood trees on, Another portion of the property, as a matter of fact, I think in the early 70s, that was the one and only time the district logged. Um, uh, Garrison logging came in. Uh, that was the first, I think, and only time the district logged in a long time. Someone that was more more set up and it was more their, their charter to really develop and, and monitor watershed uh, than we are. So this is an important environmental place. It is. That, that we need to take into consideration is what I'm hearing from you. It is, but it's not a piece of a property that we take, you know, we have other important environmental watershed that we take water off of that need maintenance, need fire management. It, it needs to be addressed. And I, I feel more comfortable addressing the properties that we're using as a water source than ones that we are not using as a water source because we just don't have enough finances uh, and resources to do it all. Well, I understand. That's my that. opinion, not, not, <laughs> obviously not the board's opinion probably. Yeah, opinion. I understand that and yeah, it would be great if we could find somebody who would take care of the property that we'd know it was being well taken care of. I think that would ease uh, concerns by the public and and by board members if we found somebody uh, like you were saying to take care of the property we wouldn't just sell it to private people to build on or whatever and I, I believe we could do that under and I'll let Gina speak to that under surplus property on one of these three categories to another public agency or another agency that would uh, protect and preserve. Okay. That you answered my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lois. Rick, uh, uh, just another quick question for you. I don't, with respect to the properties that are um, considered surplus and you're asking to add to the surplus list, uh, 
Do we have an idea what all of those properties in question are costing the district annually, if anything? I, I don't know if there's any costs it's, associated it's with it. You know, um, you know, it's staff time on removing garbage. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, some tree work that had to be done from an adjoining property owner that's, you know, concerned about dead tree. It's minimal, but there is a life. There's a liability out there. Right. Yeah. Is there any idea what sort of gain we might receive from selling these identified properties? Most of them are postage size lots. However, there are a handful that are flat postage size lots that would add um, possibly ADA property to the, to the neighbor on one or two sides, uh, mm -hmm. very accessible. So they could generate um, some revenue. And then, of course, the, you know, the acreage at Olympia, I have no idea um, without some type of an appraisal. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, Rick. That was... But I think it would be, a, a, you know, it'd be a few dollars and we all get said and done because I'm not sure, but the Lumpico property, you may be, I think it has septic water um, buildings on it. You may be able to live there. I don't know. You have to check with the county on that. Right. Um, okay. So it's possible. That there's some of these may have a pretty good value. Thank you. Uh, no other questions from the board. We'll let Gina continue with her uh, remainder of her presentation. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Rick. Um, and I, I just want to start by underscoring what Rick said uh, initially, which is that we're not looking for any formal decision tonight by the board. This is just an effort to get kind of feedback in general direction so that we can bring a formal package to the board that the board can approve. Um, uh, that said, we may ask for, you know, a motion or something if it's a little unclear which direction the board wants us to go in order to, uh, just to help us um, finalize the recommendation for when we bring this back. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the draft policy that I'm proposing for the disposal of surplus land. Um, this policy is intended to do a couple of things. First, it's to help us comply um, with the Surplus Land Act that was recently made of it, uh, applicable to special districts, as I discussed a little bit earlier. Um, and it's also intended to help um, avoid conflicts of interest and gift of public fund issues. Um, essentially, it's, it's to provide a process that will help make sure we dot the I's and cross the T's in terms of the legal requirements of how we dispose of this property. And of course, I will be um, you know, taking a close look at the final package to make sure everything is in um, compliance with law so that um, as this stuff gets disposed, um, uh, you know, we don't create any issues for ourselves. Um, but that said, I also want to help the district come up with a process that's cost effective so that, you know, the costs of legal review and sales and so forth don't dwarf the value of these properties. Um, so uh, I've attached the Surplus Land Act um, as it was enacted in 2019 under Assembly Bill 1486. Um, that contains the that assembly bill uh, 1486 that's part of the board packet contains the provisions that apply to the district. Um, I've put it there because uh, just for reference for anybody who really wants to dig into the specifics. Um, but I'm going to talk about the process at a higher level that doesn't go through all the, the detailed requirements of that law. So just speaking at a really high level, the process that we're going to follow to dispose of these lands involves, like Rick said, putting them into one of three buckets. Um, the first one being surplus land, that's land that doesn't qualify for the exemption under the Surplus Land Act. That land has to be posted, a notification has to be posted to a state website um, before we can sell it. And we also have to provide notices to certain government entities that may have an interest in using the land for housing or public space, et cetera. So, um, We've got an additional hurdle with land that doesn't qualify for the exemption um, that we have to meet before um, we can auction it off. So uh, the process there for the surplus land is, you know, we post it to the state's website, we offer it by letter to the agencies that we're required to offer it to, and then if uh, nobody responds to our notice, 
then we get to auction the land off. Um, the next category is exempt surplus land. That land does not have to be posted to the state's website um, and it does not have to be offered to public agencies before it can be um, sold. So within that category, we have certain lands that it may, it's gonna make sense to just auction. Um, these are lands that are exempt um, because of perhaps size, um, et cetera, um, but that we don't have to offer to an adjoining property owner or another special district, et cetera. But some of the for some of the categories of exempt surplus land, it's required. Um, that the land either be offered to um, an adjoining property owner or to another public agency, et cetera. So um, for any exempt surplus land, we're gonna have to determine whether it can be auctioned or whether it has to be offered uh, to an adjoining property owner or to a public agency, et cetera. And I would add that if land is exempt and it's not going to be offered via auction, um, for that land, there's gonna be another step the board has to do, which is, um, for example, let's say the district offers the land to an adjoining property owner and the property owner makes a good um, offer and the district wants to sell it, then the board is gonna have to approve that sale because it's not being done um, uh, systematically through the auction process. Um, so kind of stepping through the elements of the draft plan that starts on page 87 of the board packet, um, the first couple of sections uh, really reiterate what I just said. Um, the process is that the district manager prepares a recommendation and request for the board. You see the initial sort of draft of that recommendation tonight. You'll see a final one when we come back to the board. Then the board is going to have to, by resolution, put each of those parcels into one of the applicable categories, exempt surplus land um, or surplus land. And for the exempt surplus land, there's gonna to have to be a recommendation of whether it's gonna be disposed of by auction or whether it's gonna be offered to a contiguous property owner or offered for donation or exchange to another public agency or another entity. Um, so uh, let's see a couple of other elements of this. Of course, we're gonna to have to follow the conflicts of interest code with this as well as with all um, uh, uh, contractual um, uh, contracts of the district. Um, but in an abundance of caution, we've also recommended in the district in the draft plan that all um, sound, uh, st staff board and committee members and their immediate family members uh, be prohibited from participating as a buyer in a public auction or any other disposal of the surplus real property. And that's just to avoid any um, Steer well clear of any potential issues under the conflicts of interest code. Uh, lastly, um, the district manager did mention that there's a desire to notify um, neighborhoods and neighbors of some of the lands that are going to be sold off of a pending sale by auction. And so um, I'm planning to add, that is not in the current draft policy that you see in front of you, but I'm planning to add it to the draft policy that will come back to the board for approval. And of course, I'm open to any other changes or suggestions that the board may have um, before this comes back for final board approval. Is that it, Gina? That's it. Okay, you got you to work on your clothes so I know when you're done. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bob, you have a, uh, a question or a comment? Yeah, just a, just a couple of questions. So, so when, I, um, when I look at the spreadsheet that is available, it looks like we have land that is either surplus or exempt surplus other than auction. And I, I, I guess the, the format of the draft resolution, it, it wasn't, I mean, the three categories look like they're in there, but they weren't like really crystal clear for me. It's like there was exempt or surplus and then exempt, there was sort of a, a longer list of other possibilities. So I'm not, but I didn't see anything in there for exempt other than auction. Am I not coming through? 
You're breaking well, up, but uh, I think we understood your question. Yeah, I think if I can, I'll take that and, and Rick may want to jump in, but um, for some of the exempt parcels, I think we're going to need to flesh out um, the disposition process a little bit for the final resolution by the board because the precise method of disposition depends on the reason why it's declared exempt surplus. Um, so for example, if it's exempt surplus because it's smaller than a certain size and it's um, uh, being offered to a contiguous property owner, then of course you have to actually offer it to the contiguous property owner. Um, but another grounds for exemption is that um, for example, the property can be exchanged to for another property that's useful for the district. So if it's exempt for that reason, then we've got to offer it to another agency that, um, or we've got to offer it in exchange for other property that's useful to the district. So um, I think we're going to need to flesh out that category a little bit in the final spreadsheet that comes back with the resolution for board approval. Yeah, and it, it, it might help to also have maybe a summary table or something of what the various options are and what the requirements are. I just, I, I got lost going through the, uh, through the pros. And what I'm, what I'm concerned about is just making sure that it's very clear to our community what, what the various options are. Um, I mean, I, I poked around a little bit with the list and you know, there's one parcel that's not buildable, but it's right next to two other parcels that are empty, owned by the same person, <laughs> of course, you know, and if they got all three, they'd be at 1.03 acres, which basically is a buildable a lot at that point. So I, I want to make sure that, you know, what we're communicating out into the public is really clear about what the various paths are for each one of these parcels. And the, the resolution may not be the best way to um, communicate that. Uh, the legal language of the resolution may not be the best way to communicate that. Well, I, I'd, I'd imagine that you would have, as part of that resolution, you would have an attachment that would state all that. Am I correct, Gina? That would break down the individual parcels and their status, either exempt, surplus, or uh, exempt surplus? I think that would be a good way to communicate all the specifics of the board's final decision and support the necessary findings, yes. And and Bob, that's the reason you know we're not gonna we're not gonna look in to see you know the, as as dig as deep as you did on um, you know who owns the parcels, but it's important. I look at who owns them. Yeah, that it's important that we notify the adjoining parcels and and get this posted in the neighborhoods, so people know, and you know not just go through the auction house on the two hundred thousand on their list. Because you know that list is good, we may get some uh, some interested people, but these parcels really only have a use to the adjoining parcel next door. Um, I, I guess what I was asking is is I get the table about you know making sure we're classifying them. I guess for each one of those classifications, if there could be a a bullet point summary of what's involved in disposing of property via that classification. I think that would just be, um, I think that would make things very, very clear. That may not be compatible with what you need to do for a res not involved with this every day to take a, a look at something and go, oh, okay, this is classification. This is what has to happen. Am I interested or not? Move on or, or mm -hmm. you know, go down to the next step. All right. I think that's council's uh, intention that we make this as clear as possible okay. so that someone from the outside could look in and, and be able to understand it. And I think that's yeah. really important and that's our, our plan. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, part of this feedback, I mean, it looks like what happened is after the admin committee, there was some additional um, uh, research and um, additional value, uh, valuable information put into this. And so we didn't cover all the, just for everybody else on the board, we didn't cover all this specific detail during the admin committee, but we did get a very in-depth conversation about the uh, auction process and the parcels themselves and that sort of thing, which I think was helpful. All right, the zoning wasn't added to the list that the, uh, you know, we built onto the spreadsheet. 
um, since right. the, yeah, and, and zoning for the for the buyers is very important, right? Right. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's good. Let's move. Yeah, and there is a uh, zoning uh, uh, definition sheet from the county uh, behind the spreadsheet yep. that, that states what all those different zones of zoning is. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, any other uh, questions from any of the other uh, directors before we let the public share some thoughts or comments? Let's, let's go to our attendees who've dwindled by one. Anybody? Uh, yes, Jim Mosier, you have the floor. Thank you, Steve. I first want to say I am support of uh, getting rid of these surplus properties that have no use for the district, the small ones. Um, where my concern lies is the <clears throat> land that is watershed, uh, particularly the Olympia watershed. Um, I think it's a broader discussion that we need to have about the district's role in protecting the watershed generally, not just that part of the watershed that the, the district has direct interest in, in terms of water rights. That's a very sensitive area. Um, I'm not, uh, as the only public agency that has watershed protections, SLV um, watershed protection as a specific mission, I think it is incumbent on the district to be very uh, careful about how we manage the watershed. Um, so I'm very concerned about the notion that we might sell that property off. Um, and I'm not sure, given the sensitive nature of it, who would want it. Um, and, you know, the idea that maybe Santa Cruz City might uh, take it or that a land trust might take it, they have very different missions than we do in terms of protecting our watershed. So I hope that before the board took any action to make that property a surplus property that the public would be brought into the discussion. There would be some uh, review by environmental scientists um, to advise us on its importance and what's needed in order to keep uh, the watershed healthy. It's, it's not just sensitive land, but it's also unique. Um, a property that uh, I, I personally think the districts uh, to, uh, overseeing it is really critically important to our environment here. Thank you. If, if I could just inter interject, uh, Chair Swan. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mosier referred to this as the Olympia watershed. And I've had a couple of emails saying, this is not the Olympia watershed. The Olympia watershed is the property located directly behind Zyani fire. This is the Zyani watershed that's several miles up in the Zyani Canyon. Um, the Olympia watershed is not being discussed tonight. That is very sensitive habitat. It has our Olympia well field uh, on the parcels and that's located right behind Zyani fire. I just want to make sure that people aren't getting this confused. The property in question, if you, if you do pull up the county's GIS, is several miles up into Zyani, off of Zyani Creek, uh, 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 up, up in the canyon. It's completely two different watersheds. Just, just a clarification. Well, thanks, Rick. I, I didn't realize that. That uh, relieves some of my concern. Um, and I will do a little more research on this again. I think it would be uh, really important for, uh, for there to be good public discussion about uh, any of the land we would give up that's part of the watershed. Right. Well, that's, why, and that's why we're here tonight, and that's why it's listed to, to, to for, for further discussion. Um, so, I, you know, it, it is not just a slam dunk, so to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mosier. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, uh, Sinzen, Cindy, Sinzi, who is that? That's Sin, please, Sin, please Sin, state Sin. your name and let us have your comment or question. This is Cynthia Zenzel. And thank you, Cynthia. I just figured out how to unmute myself. Um, I have concerns also about the water rights and the watersheds. So the Zyani office and plant, are there water rights associated with that property that would give a potential buyer the right to use that water? Um, Cynthia, uh, okay, that's the Lumpico piece. Uh, at the Lumpico office, we do have water rights. The property would not come 
with the water supply permit. We have been in discussion with Cal Fish and Wildlife and I'll ask uh, our uh, environmental planner, Carly, to jump in here because I've asked her and she's reached out. We have had discussion and are looking at, Carly, help me out here, returning that water right back to the stream. Right, we're, right? we're thinking um, about doing a 1707 permit through the regional board, which is an in-stream dedication for that water. Um, we've talked to the county um, and I've talked extensively to the regional board about starting that process. Does okay. that answer your question? Uh, yes. What about um, the potential use of any of these properties as uh, recharge areas for the, are they of interest to the Santa Margarita uh, Groundwater Agency at all? I've reached out to, um, to our consultant. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank what her name is right now. Uh, Georgina. Georgina, um, and two of these parcels have wells, very small parcels, or like 20 by 20, that have wells, uh, deep water wells in, in Lampico, to see if they would be any use for monitoring wells as part of the, the groundwater monitoring program. And at this point, they would not. And the majority of these parcels are very small postage stamp parcels. So, of course, the acreage is right on Zianni Creek. And it's quite a ways, you know, up in the Zioni watershed. And would not have a use uh, in the in the in those aquifers for recharge. My my other question uh, that comes up because in my neighborhood, a local contractor has succeeded in acquiring unbuildable lots that he then was able to get through the permit process to build. Uh, structures on whether a full-size house or an ADU and I anticipate that in some neighborhoods there would be pushback if the neighbors realized that allowing uh, an adjacent property owner to acquire that property would mean those properties would be built on and increase the density in that neighborhood so I'm wondering whether um, there's any requirement that you do sell to the adjacent property owner or whether neighbors can join in to take that property off the market and preserve it as unbuildable. Well, I mean, I, I, and I'll let council speak up, but anybody will have the auction process and that's where I think it's important that the district do its due diligence and making sure that the local neighborhood knows that these parcels are coming up and not just be on auction websites um, to make sure that the adjoining parcels know that it's coming up so everybody has a chance to, uh, to bid on the parcels. And the way the auction works, the auction at close, if there's a bid, it can and, and it will continue for an additional 15 minutes after close and then there's another bid it continues in an additional 15 minutes until there are no bids. So it could actually, according to the, uh, the auction folks, it could go on for a couple of days if there's, if there's continual bidding. Anybody will have a, a chance to bid on it, but as far as you know, what happens to the parcel, uh, that's pretty much out of the control of the district. And Gina, do you want to add to that? or? I think that's a fair summary. And we've had that situation happen before more money for the district. And is it possible to put some kind of restriction on the property, say to prevent logging or development? From the district standpoint, no, that would come from the county. You know, the county does land management. The district would not have any, I don't think any uh, right to do such a, a covenant. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, any further comments or questions from any of our um, public attendees? No, okay. We'll go back to the panel here. Uh, Lois, your name, uh, your, you found that button again. 
you are recognized. Yeah. Aren't you sorry you told me where it was? No, it's terrific. <laughs> Great to see technology creeping into you. Yeah. Um, well, I can only speak for Long Pico, sort of. Um, but most of the lots in Long Pico are very small. I happen to have five lots and I don't have an acre. Um, I, I did own a couple of more lots and at that point had an acre, but there was a house on it. So for somebody to be able to build, they need to have an acre here in Long Pico. So I think it would be a little hard to come by with some of these small lots. Most people would just pick them up to have some privacy. Um, now, maybe they could do a grandmother uh, unit on it because I don't know that you need a, uh, an acre to add a grandma unit. Um, but for the most part, I don't think a lot of the lots that are being listed now or in Long Pico. Most of them, I don't think you're gonna, it's not gonna be an issue. And then there's Long Pico Creek. Um, that creek, uh, they're not gonna be able to get um, water rights to Long Pico Creek because there's salmon in that creek and the water district had a hard enough time trying to use any of the water out of the creek. We did use some, but um, it, it's, there are a lot of uh, safeguards put in place to protect the creek um, and to protect overbuilding in Long Pico. Thank you, Lois. Anything else? No? Bob, your uh, hand is up. Yeah, I, I did a, I looked at about a dozen or so of them. I only found one that might possibly result in a, if it was joined with the two adjacent lots, a, a buildable lot. Most of the ones I looked at were enclaves. They're surrounded by other, um, somebody else's parcel. I assume that back in the midst of time, the owner of the parcel at that time gave the property of the district as part of a mutual water association or something like that. And, you know, we're dealing with the historical legacy of that. It, 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 it's just really important that as a public agency that we keep our footprint to, um, particularly in those kinds of parcels, to what we really need in order to run um, the agency and to return that parcel, hopefully, back to the owner that, that originally gave it or to their heirs or uh, successors. Um, I also want to weigh in a little bit on, on Jim Mosher's comment. I definitely agree with Jim that the Zianti property is worthy of uh, a more in-depth discussion. And we kind of started that a little bit at the admin committee level. Um, the, the parcel is zoned, I think, parks and recreation and certainly one of the you know, questions I had about is whether it could be turned into um, a, a park or recreational area by partnering with some uh, third party agency or whether it would just be better to um, uh, dispose of it to an agency who specializes in this kind of parcel or whether there's some surrounding parcels that might be interested in it. I noticed one is right next to a fairly large uh, structure. I don't exactly know what the structure is, but you know, there may be uh, some additional interest on, on their part, but we definitely do need to have that uh, conversation. That, that is part of, I would say, an overall watershed area, but it's, it's not part of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's watershed area. Um, as I've said before, I'll defend our watershed areas vigorously and aggressively against anybody trying to encroach on them. That those parcels are a little bit different. They don't they don't deliver water to our customers. Um, and while they may be valuable to um, other agencies, 
um, they don't have as much value to us as, for example, Ben Lomond Mountain does. So um, it may be that there are other agencies looking for this kind of opportunity or some nonprofit or NGO um, that might be able to really make use of that in a way that's compatible with the, uh, with the land. So I'm looking forward to having that uh, conversation with uh, the community. Bob, uh, Lou, you're uh, up. Thank you, Steve. A quick question for either Rick or Gina. Is there any limitation or restrictions to the funds that we receive in selling any of these surplus properties? Um, I, I'm gonna refer that to Gina, but I have, I have a recommendation uh, once we get to that point, but I don't know if there's uh, limitations. I'll refer to council. Yeah, I, I can't think of any. Um, I suppose um, Rick would know more than I did about whether any of these parcels were subject to some special agreement, but I, I doubt that's the case. Yeah, we, we have no, to, to my knowledge, any special agreement, but when it comes to the Lumpico parcels, you know, we do have a uh, large overruns on projects associated with the consolidation of Lumpico. And I would think that we would could use that money to help offset some of those over construction overruns. Um, and I would recommend that to the board. Thank you. I think that makes sense. But if any other funds that we would get from selling surplus property, I would certainly like to see them funneled into infrastructure. All right. There are several things you could do. I mean, obviously it goes right back into our into our reserves. Uh, you could use it for, for fire management, for improvements, uh, removal of invasive species on other properties, uh, you know, enhancements to watershed, or we can just put it, you know, in our reserve funds. It's totally up to the board. Anything else, Lou? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bob, you're... Um... Rick, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the properties out of Long Pico, I, I agree with Rick. We're, and I think we, again, talked about this a little bit in the admin committee. We're, you know, I think we're two million, million and a half, two million um, over on uh, our Long Pico program. We have not fulfilled all of the promises that we made to Long Pico yet relative to the service lines. And, um, and the, I think we also have the, the, um, the main supply line uh, that still has to be done too, I think, correct, Rick? That's correct. Yeah. So I, I think definitely the money from anything that's sold in Long Pico needs to. I, you know, I don't have a number. I, on even it. at that, I think there's still going to be significant. Yeah, I, even at that, I think there's still going to be significant overruns that we're going to have to address as part of the allocation process of the three million we currently have in margin dollars to allocate to a variety of areas, including infrastructure, pensions, um, reserves, uh, main, deferred maintenance, and that sort of thing. So those are all, um, but, but the Lompico property needs to go for that. The rest of it, I would tend to agree with you, Lou, would need to go into infrastructure. I don't want to mislead the board, but I don't think we're going to see you know, large windfall from this. A lot of these are postage stamps. A lot of this people, you know, are not going to bid a lot of money. You know, maybe a couple hundred thousand or less, hundred thousand dollars, but it's, it's still good money. Don't get me wrong, but we're not going to see millions. Oops. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm getting signals that my internet has become unstable. So I don't know if it yeah. was me hearing uh, Bob with issues or if it was my own playback having an issue. Uh, I get the same thing. Okay. Uh, Lois, I'm sorry, Bob, were you, yeah. did you get your question answered? Uh, okay. Hang on, Lois. I'm, I don't uh, want to get Bob off. Are you finished, Bob? For yeah, the thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Lois, go ahead. Okay, about um, the Long Pico properties, I don't think they're gonna bring a lot of money in either. I think part of the problem that happened here 
why Wampico came up so short is there's been a tremendous amount of cost for the environmental issues. Um, and I, I'm not allowed to laugh about this. <laughs> Sorry. But like, I think, is it the Lewis tank where there's an endangered species of rat and it's having to be moved elsewhere so it isn't hurt while they're working on the Lewis um, tanks? Is that right, Rick? Well, I, I think council will slap my hand if I start talking about construction projects. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'd be happy to discuss with you. Yes, there are environmental pro uh, issues with some of the Lompico problems, projects. I, I mean, there's been a number of issues that came up that when all of this, when all the numbers were brought up for Lompico, they didn't really include that that I could ever see. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming the, uh, the people who came up with the numbers. I'm just saying there's been a lot of things, delay, um, inf uh, environmental, uh, just so many things that have creeped up. Oh, there was tribal lands was one of them also. It's, it's just been like, oh my gosh, one thing after another. And, um, but are you lucky to get us? I like yes. that smile. <laughs> yes. So we're ready to, are we ready to move on with some recommendations here? Yep. So I've got a recommendation that you continue to proceed with uh, disposing of the property in the best fashion possible with Gina's comments and with with guidance, again, a review from, uh, or any input from uh, from our environmentalist uh, on staff, if there's any concerns that we should have. So what I'm hearing then, just uh, let me recap a little bit, I'll turn it back over to Gina, that move ahead as recommend, recommended, um, develop uh, the three bucket lists for, for parcels, uh, exempt status, exempt surplus, or surplus, and further evaluation of the Ziani seven parcels, Ziani watershed uh, will be needed. So we will not include them in the surplus at this time. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't know that I'm suggesting that you preclude from including the Ziani parcels. If, if, uh, if some sort of assessment can be done in a reasonable time as to whether we need to be concerned with it, well, I think, you know, just from what I've heard, and I'll, and I'll turn it back over to the board, I don't want uh, to assume, it sounds like maybe we should take these parcels to the, maybe to the environmental committee and see where that, what flushes out there, and then move it ahead. I don't think we can move ahead. I'd like to move ahead. We can always come back, but I don't want to slow down while we do an environmental assessment or try to come up with a recommendation on the Ziani parcels and hold up on the other. Not unless, you, uh, I, I guess I'll turn it back to the board for direction. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with that statement. If you want to separate out the Ziani stuff so that it can be studied a little more carefully to make sure that it's treated with the, the most utmost care and concern to the environment. But yeah, other, other than that, get rid of the stuff that's been declared excess and surplus and, and all of that is at the, <coughs> at the fastest uh, rate of speed possible, given the circumstances. That's my take on it. I'll let the other directors speak for themselves. Or not. Gina, do you have well, any thoughts? Bob, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Steve. <clears throat> I think one of the issues about this has been that <clears throat> the previous boards have declared surplus, but have not really executed. And we really need to get into an execution phase as quickly as possible. There, there's no reason to keep um, analyzing this over and over again. It, we, we know what the answer is. Staff's got the answer in this for the ones we declared surplus. 
let's just get it done, get into the hands of people that can do it and do it efficiently. And perhaps that's really the benefit that we have right now is that the internet has brought a lot of efficiencies and, and we're gonna take advantage of one here. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and sorry, Lou? Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Steve. Um, I agree with everything that Rick and um, Steve and Bob have said, and my only question is, do we need a motion or can we just do this off of consensus? I'll refer, I'll refer to council. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a need for a motion tonight. Um, so long as there's a, some consensus in terms of what we're to do next. And it sounds like there, there is to, uh, to a great extent. All right, uh, Rick. Go yes. Ahead. Um, so I I consent I consent to this. I agree with uh, I think what we're hearing is a consensus of lessening liabilities, adding revenue, and getting something done that we talked about doing for a long period of time. So uh, yes, I agree. We should move forward with this. Uh, one thing I would like to see is uh, a map so I can put these places. Uh, in a physical locales, you know, I just need to see a map that we could have some of these sites. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll work with you on that, Rick. Um, hey, Rick. It's difficult to get a big map, but I'd like to work with you on the county GIS site because you can really pull up some great information with mapping. You can do the Google, you know, the Earth, the satellite, and you can do the overlay APNs. I mean, I think that would uh, would be the way to go. I'll work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And uh, Lois, can we get a, an acknowledgement from you? Consensus. You agree with the consensus? Okay. Thank you, Lois. That's uh, uh, that should provide the direction that I think staff was asking for. Okay. It's just pretty much moved ahead as recommended, and we moved the uh, the seven. So any watershed parcels, we are not going to move them into a bucket at this time to declare surplus. We will move those for further review, starting with the Environmental Committee. Sounds good. Are you sure of that? Yep. Okay. okay, what's next, uh, Rick? That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we move into that? department status reports and the consent agenda. I do believe. Okay. Let me double check. Yes, I do believe we are moving so in. The consent, consent is agenda. next. Consent agenda. We're up to the consent. Okay, anybody have, anybody have anything they want pulled from the minutes that are represented in the consent agenda? Um, I do I do have a, a question, Steve. Sure. Uh, I don't know, if, is James still on the, the virtual meeting? You better be. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the operations report um, from the last um, board meeting, and that is I did not see any information relative to overtime for that month. Was that, uh, did I miss it or is it, was it left out of the report? Um, no, I think it was missed if that was the case because it was in there. Okay, well, I, I didn't see it, James. I mean, I looked twice and, and didn't see the, the overtime report, so. Okay, so you're looking for the overtime report from May? Uh, yeah, I think that would be the. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I will check, double check that and I'll make sure that I put it in the next report if it okay. was not in there. So I'm going to thank you. I'm, I'm going to assume then that we uh, we don't have any issues with the previous minutes and that the consent agenda is accepted. The minutes are in uh, with that issue. Next up, district reports, status reports, anything that uh, anybody wants to bring up relative to engineering, environmental, finance and business, legal or operations. Are there any questions for any of those uh, departments from anybody? I have a few questions. Bob, go right ahead. 
Um, this one's for Carly. Carly, about how much time are you spending on the um, uh, working with Chatterbox and the outreach? What, what percentage of your time? As far as percentage, um, it's probably 20 to 30 depending on what we're doing um, or less I would say thinking about filling out my time card today I was probably spending two to three hours a week at max um, when we were putting out newsletters or press releases um, but besides that I would say probably an hour um, a week on okay, average great, thanks on the on the water quality switching from wells to uh, surface and vice vice versa mm -hmm. um have we considered putting uh, an icon pair on the website to sort of show where we are with um uh, surface versus wells just something to think about um on that and then if they click on it they could get to a lot more information behind it which i think is what you were including water quality reports and all that um yeah. let's see um on the french broom poll um mm -hmm. which can Sultan actually helped the district staff pull French broom. Jody McGraw Consulting. Okay. And also on a um, maintenance issue, we, there was one where a contractor drilled through an eight inch main. Um, do we get reimbursed for whatever expenses that we incur when that kind of thing happens just in general? We do bill the contractor. Uh, do they pay? <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. And when they don't, do we take them to collections, small claims? How do we basically make it so that people don't want to do that kind of thing? Well, it's been said that it's not worth going to collections or claim on these in the past, as far as since I've been in this position. How much did that one cost us to fix? I don't have the solid number off the top of my head, but I can get that to you. There's, there's more to that. I mean, obviously operations and, and finance. On, um, we've been talking. Did they get a eight one one before they drill. Right. We've been about about recouping our funds. We've been in currently in in, in talk with council. Um, Recouping funds is not that easy. We need to develop a, a policy and uh, the finance manager and I have been talking about the mechanism to recoup costs um, from construction damage or, um, uh, you know, contractor. Um, that. There's more to that and that we will be developing a policy and working on recollection of funds. Fair, fair enough. Did they get an 811 before they drill? Most of the time, yes. Sometimes, no. You know, it's, 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 everyone's different. And this one happened to be done, and don't ask me why, but they were out in the middle of the night about three in the morning, four in the morning, putting in signs, this contractor was, and hit the pipe. Yeah, that's so correct. He, and they did not call 811. They, they did not call 811, of course. And so, um, by law, that should be easy to recoup. But as you know, easy to recoup and having to go through a collection process or a legal process is also costly. Yeah, and this contractor was very up owning to what they had done and taking responsibility to the fullest. So I don't see us not getting paid on that one. Okay, well, that, that's good. I mean, it's it having a policy in place to deal with these, particularly if they don't do 811, I think is, is really important. Um, and Correct. James, on your uh, water production, I see that we're still at 50%, or at least in June, we were, where were we still? 40% more or less? That's pretty good for a light rainfall year, isn't it? Yeah, it has a lot to do with the Felton system, though. They're all surface water, pretty much. So okay. that has a lot to do with our, how we stay at a 50% or better. And are we in compliance with uh, the Felton um, permit? Yes, we are. On on both Felton and the downstream and the and the San Lorenzo River. Yes, we are. Great, thank you. And Lou, to answer your question, it looks like the wrong overtime after hours was attached. 
you're correct. So I'll be sure to put that into next month's report along with July. All right, thank you. Terrific, any other, uh, any other queries about uh, any of the department status reports from anybody? I have one question. Is it appropriate to ask how the uh, process for hiring a new engineer is going? We are in the process. Um, we are, we've narrowed down to one candidate. Uh, we have made him a, a higher offer and he is reviewing our offer. Great. Terrific, thanks for the update. Uh, okay, anything else? Bob, yes. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to ask this on my earlier one. Rick, are we still gonna be able to get these two pipeline projects done before winter? Um, yeah, well, we just issued the notice to proceed. I mean, it'll be close, but we're moving. Uh, I, we're not, I think we're about a week behind schedule. And now we're just waiting for the contractor. You know, he has, I, I forget what the amount of days are, but it's a short, once the notice to proceed is issued, you know, all this paperwork's in, all this insurance and bonds and everything are in. It has a short timeline now to gear up and, and turn into a schedule. So he'll be moving right along. I mean, we're confident that we'll get through. They're both okay, well, small that. projects. Go ahead, James. Yeah, so the notice to proceed went out to the construction management engineering firm. And the pre-construction meeting is scheduled for next week. And once the pre-construction meeting is done, the day after the award or the notice to proceed goes out to the contractor. Okay. And then they have 10 days to start work from that day. And that's so when our letter will go out after the pre-construction meeting to the neighborhood saying which road right. to start first and, and give a, a description of the project. But it sounds like we may not start before mid-August. Hmm. Possibly, yeah, it, it's probably right. They're small, they're not large projects. They're not really okay. traffic related. So they're, they're probably you know, more or less blow and go. I don't see these projects taking that long. You know, they're, the traffic is non-existent. Um, they're relatively easy projects. There's nothing, it's just pipe services, blow and go. Yeah, and they all have to be on the job in the first week of August okay. yeah. with the 10 days to start all right. work. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks, Bob. Uh, okay, anything else from anybody with questions for the departments? Any, anybody want to talk about the committee reports, environmental facilities in the packet? Any questions about them? Well, I'll, I'm prepared to make a little report about our environmental committee meeting today. Please do. Okay, thank you. So we held our meeting this morning at 945. Uh, Carly Blanchard, our environmental planner, uh, made a update on the fire management plan. Uh, she is working with a consultant for Panorama about fire, finalizing a grant from Cal Fire. Uh, that grant is uh, to go to 70 to 90 percent of the cost share not exactly sure what that means but um that is uh by the end of the month i believe you said carly right right and, we'll be submitting uh, mm -hmm. yes uh there has been uh site visits by panorama to do infrastructure mapping for planning defensible space around that infrastructure and uh staff and consultant were meeting later today or earlier today okay and then we also had biologist, uh, Dr. Jody McGraw gave an update on the Olympia Habitat Plan and the Conservation Area Management Plan. Um, they are sending that plan to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for review. Um, the conservation area or easement is an area to protect local endangered species and restore the Sand Hills habitat that those species live in. Also to compensate for Sandhills habitat the district uses in its various projects. Um, there is a five-year plan for the Olympia Conservation Area, uh, which is 6.3 acres. Uh, Jody and staff uh, did some broom removal recently on that conservation area. It was done by hand using uh, hand strength and a weed wrench. 
and uh, that reflects the board's policy on herbicide use. And I'm glad to see uh, things are moving in a forward direction in the um, management of that 6.3 conservation area. Thank you. That was our meeting. Thank you, Rick. Yep. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Did I, ca did I capture that pretty quickly, Carly? You did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's no uh, written uh, communication, information material. There's a copy of the article about the um, acquisition of generators in the packet, and I don't see anything else going on. So unless there's any final comments, questions from anybody, I'm going to call this puppy adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you attendees for attending, and thank you staff for staying late and participating we appreciate it and we'll see you all next uh thank you. next meeting thanks everybody thanks steve thanks everybody